Good evening and welcome to tonight's Peace Peace It webinar. I'm Brian Farrell and tonight we're going to be talking about uh, CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-802 and specifically we're going to be discussing exam objectives 4.2 and 4.3. Good evening Sarah and welcome to the webinar. Like I said, my name is Brian Farrell. Uh, there's a few of my qualifications and certi certifications and whatnot. I am the instructor for PACET's TNI program, Technology and Integration Support. I'm also an I IT instructor for Edmonds Community College, and the course that I teach is CIS 205, which surprisingly enough happens to be PACET's TNI program. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and first off talk about what those exam objectives are that I'm going to be covering tonight. Uh, objective 4.2 of the 220-802 exam talks about troubleshooting common problems with motherboards, CPUs, random access memory, and power. And Exam objective 4.3 talks about troubleshooting common problems on hard drives, hard drives, and RAID arrays. I don't go into a whole lot of depth when I bring talk about these subjects, so if you have questions, go ahead and shoot them to me, and I will see if I can answer them. And so with that, let's go ahead and move on to exam objective 4.2, which is like I said earlier, troubleshooting motherboards, CPUs, RAM, and power, specifically power supplies. First up, I'm going to mention some tools that you should have if you're going to be troubleshooting these items. And the first item is a screwdriver or a set of screwdrivers. Comes in handy if you want to get into most cases and or if you need to remove some components, at least some of them. Uh, multimeters also come in handy. Uh, these allow you to check for the appropriate voltages, make sure everything's getting the power that it that it should have. I will say that all multimeters are not created equal. Uh, this is one of the few times that I will tell you that you should step up and spend a little bit of money if you're going to buy a multimeter. Buy a fairly decent one. Buy one that's a little bit higher quality. Um, probably middle of the road in value or just a little bit below the middle of the road, you'll be much happier than if you just spend $29.95 for a basic multimeter. Another item that you might want to consider picking up is a power supply tester. Uh, these can help you to simulate the load on a power supply and it will display the voltages. Uh, it's actually a pretty useful method of testing power supplies. It's actually one of the best methods that's out there. And finally, you might want to consider picking up a uh, power on self-test card, a postcard. This is an adapter card that plugs into either a PCI or a PCIe slot, and it will display codes that point out where a post failure occurs. They're pretty good. They come in handy when troubleshooting some problems with motherboards. If you're really lucky, your motherboard happens to have a post tester built into it, in which case you look at the output on the digital display and you look up the code in the manual. So now that your basic tools are out of the way, let's talk about some common problems and they're most likely cause and what you can do about it. Uh, you'll see a lot of similarities when I go through these things, and I am going to run through them pretty fast. But you can always ask questions. So if your PC is, ex is experiencing uh, unexpected shutdowns, uh, spe specifically if it's been up and running for a little while and then it just kind of shuts down, you wait a moment, you turn it back on, it runs for a while, and then it shuts back down. Well, your most likely cause is too much heat. 
Uh, the fix is to check your ventilation and clean up your fans. Also check to make sure that the fans are operational. Well, kind of similar to that is system lockups. If you're moving along, everything seems to be working fine, and then the system locks up and will not respond, and you don't have any software errors, the most likely ca cause is heat. Do the same thing. Check check the ventilation. Clean out your fans. Also check for fan operation. Now I just mentioned the post the postcard just a little bit ago. If you're if you hit the power button and you get a couple of beeps or you get a series of beeps, but the machine does not boot up, well, that's a post error. Um, for that, you're going to need to do some research. Most manufacturers have defined their own uh, codes for the beeps. So refer to your system documentation to determine what the beeps mean from your system as it's trying to power up. Uh, if you have a blank screen on boot up, then your most likely the, your most likely cause is that you have an onboard graphics. You have onboard graphics and you have a graphics adapter in place, an add-on card. And your monitor is plugged in to the onboard graphics. Um, this is, I'd like to say that this doesn't occur very often, but actually it occurs more often than you would think. Um, and it is the most likely cause of a blank screen when you boot, when a computer will boot up. Uh, BIOS time and setting, your BIOS time and settings keep resetting. You know, your date and time and whatnot keep resetting. Well, your most likely cause is that your CMOS battery is low on power. Um, so your CMOS battery acts as your timekeeper and it also keeps the custom settings in your, in your BIOS the settings that you change. So when it starts to run down on power, guess what? Those settings get lost because like all memory, it needs some power to keep it. And a bad battery won't help you do that. So if your uh, PC keeps attempting to boot to the wrong device or to the wrong drive, then the most likely cause is a wrong setting in your BIOS. Uh, so your BIOS has the incorrect boot order priority. Uh, one of the things that I will make that I do put here is that you should use caution when making adjustments to your BIOS settings. Another thing that you can do if you're running a Windows or a more current version of Windows operating system is on when you hit the power on button, if you just hold down your F8 key, you will bring up a boot list of devices that you can pick from. So you're not just stuck with going going with what is in your BIOS. So now let's talk about boots. You have continuous reboots. Um, there are several things that this can be, and they tend to be either hardware or software related. Kind of a surprise there now, isn't it? Um, when this when this happens, it will usually be after you've installed a new piece of hardware or you've installed a new application and there's a conflict. Um, those conflicts can cause your system to reboot. You can try removing the new piece of hardware and see if you can boot up or you can boot up in safe mode to find the correct driver for that device. Or if it's software related, you can boot in safe mode and then see if you can fix the problem if it was software related. So now we go on to another topic, no power. Surprise, guess what? The most likely cause is your power supply. Uh, could be dead. Could be, maybe, maybe not. Uh, check your plugs for the power supply. Check the settings on the power supply to make sure that it's switched to the appropriate voltages for where you're at. Um, if you're feeling confident, you can also check your uh, 
battery backup or your wall outlet or your power strip, whatever you're plugging your PC into to make sure that it's supplying voltage. Uh, if it is supplying voltage and it's going to the power supply, and this is where power supply tester comes in handy because now you don't know if the power is actually coming out and making it to your motherboard or not. But more than likely, it's not and you've got a bad power supply. Now we're back to overheating. Your computer's running too hot. Well, your most likely cause on that is poor ventilation or inadequate cooling or your system has been overclocked. If you've overclocked your CPU, I would recommend going back to the manufacturer's specifications. Uh, that should bring the heat back down. Or I would recommend increasing your cooling capacity, which will also take care of that if you're overclocked. If uh, you're not overclocked and you're overheating, then more than likely uh, you've got too much dust and debris inside your case. So you have a loud noise? Well, the most likely cause is dirt. The fans tend to get really, really noisy when they get dirty, when they get too much dirt in them. Uh, most of those fans operate on ball bearings. You get the dirt inside those ball bearings and they start grinding. And it can it can sound almost like a jet trying to take off. You can try blowing out the dirt. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. A lot of the times you actually end up having to replace the fan. So how about intermittent device failure? Well, the most likely cause there is either going to be heat or it could be bad random access memory. If your ventilation is okay, you know, you've looked inside the case, there's not a whole lot of dust and debris build up, you don't have a lot of, um, you have pretty good airflow, uh, then it's a pretty good chance that your device failure is being caused by bad random access memory. So what you need to do is you need to set up the memory diagnostic utility in Microsoft Windows. I'm not sure how to do it in Apple or in Linux. And the next time you reboot, it will do, run the memory diagnostic and then tell you whether or not you have a bad stick of RAM. So you hit the power button and only your case fans spin up. Well. The most likely cause is, is that you're not getting power to the CPU. And why is that? Well, more than likely that's because the power regulator on the motherboard that supplies the power actually to the CPU has fried. It's no longer operational. And the only thing that operates without power to the CPU are the case fans. Next up, smoke. Um, the most likely cause of smoke is the power supply. Uh, smoke is never a good thing, by the way. Uh, it could be a possible short in the power supply or the incorrect voltage setting on the power supply. Uh, in particular, if you happen to be somewhere other than the United States, where most of the world uses, I do believe, 230 to 240, 230 to 240 volts, um, but your selector on the back of your power supply is set to the 110 to 120. Um, you're feeding too much power, you're feeding more power into the power supply than it's expecting, that will tend to cause smoke. Uh, that's not a good thing, more than likely if that happens you're going to have to replace your power supply and in reality if you actually get smoke out of your power supply, you should replace that thing. Uh, burning smell or sparks, uh, that's directly related to smoke. Guess what? The most likely cause is, again, a bad power supply. Possible short, uh, incorrect voltage setting. Uh, unlikely, but it could be. Uh, you might have nicked the insulation on one of the leads coming from the power supply and now you've got a short because that nick is actually resting against bare metal on the case. Uh, not very likely, but it can occur. On, on a brief side note, 
a couple of years ago, I actually developed a short in my, actually, one of my computers developed a short in the switch for the power on, and it tried to burn up the whole whole system. And that was a case where the where the sparks did not come from the power supply, but actually came from uh, a short in the power switch. And that was kind of interesting. Then we have the blue screen of death, the BSOD. Well, there's a couple of things that could cause that. Your most likely cause is either going to be either a faulty motherboard. There's a problem with the motherboard. It's going to be need to be replaced. It could be caused by bad random access or random access memory, excuse me. And finally, um, and this is actually what you will see most often, is it's hardware related. Uh, you've installed a new piece of hardware into the PC or onto the motherboard with an incorrect driver or a driver that's in conflict with another driver. Uh, that will will give you the blue screen of death more often than a bad motherboard or a bad RAM. That covers all of the objectives, well, all of the sub-objectives for the CompTIA exam 220-802, objective 4.2. Now, before I move on to exam objective 4.3, do I have any questions about the material that I've covered? Okay. So now we go on to objective 4.3, which is troubleshooting hard drives and RAID, RAID arrays. Boy, I have difficulty saying that one on occasion. Uh, this is a shorter section and probably even less detail than I went over before. But here we go. First up are the tools that you will need to have on hand or that you're going to need to use to troubleshoot hard drives and RAID arrays. We're back to the screwdriver. You need the screwdriver or screwdriver set to get inside of the case, and you also need them, in most cases, to remove the hard drive from the case so that you can test them. I do recommend having an external enclosure on hand so that you can pull a hard drive out of one case, put it in the enclosure, and then plug it into externally onto another PC so that you can run some diagnostics on it to check to see if the hard drive is actually bad. Uh, the check disk utility is a great utility. Uh, it comes in handy if you're having issues with a hard drive. Uh, the format utility is another one that comes in handy. Uh, you should have or you should be using defrag on spinning disk hard drives on a regular basis. If you happen to be running Windows 8 or 8.1 and you have a spinning disk hard drive, it automatically schedules defrag for you so you no longer have to schedule it yourself. Another thing that I recommend if you do this for very long is to have file recovery software. Sooner or later, you're going to have a hard drive that dies. It's going to have files on it that you want to recover. I recommend that you find some recovery software that you like, that you've figured out how to use, get familiar with it, and you will become a hero to whole bunches of people who lose access to their material. Or you may not want to advertise that so that they leave you in peace. That's kind of up to you. So now let's move on to common problems with hard drives. And the first thing that comes up are read-write failures. You most likely cause are bad clusters on the spinning hard disk. Um, the hard disk failure rate tends to be low. Uh, when bad clusters are the cause, but they still can occur. Uh, check disk is going to be the utility that you want to run to find bad sectors and clusters. Uh, a lot of the times it can actually try and recover information from those. 
it will mark them if you tell it to mark them, and it will no longer try to write to bad clusters. If you have a hard disk drive that come, comes up with a, um, or keeps coming up with bad clusters, I would recommend backing up your system and installing a new hard drive. If your hard disk drive had been really speedy before and then it starts becoming slower and slower, the most likely cause is file fragmentation. A highly fragmented drive will require longer seek times and write times. Running defrag on a regular basis will actually keep it nice and speedy. Uh, if we're talking about a solid state drive, they are super, super fast when you first install them, but they do start to slow down a little bit as they age. They are still faster than spinning disk, uh, but they just they just lose that that super fast responsiveness that they had when they were brand new. Nothing unusual about that. That's just a fact of life. And defrag does not work very well on solid state drives because they really don't care if they're defragmented or not. If you power up your system and you end up getting this loud clicking noise, then you are now on the clock. That is your hard drive that's getting ready to fail. As a matter of fact, every time you hear that click, that's that read head tapping the surface of one of the platters, and it's actually destroying uh, data and the disk. Shut it down. Um, you can try putting you can try putting the hard drive in a freezer for a couple of hours, and then plopping it in the machine after you've got another replacement hard drive, powering up the system and pulling the files. A lot of the times uh, the coldness of being put in the freezer will actually reduce the amount of times that that reed head taps the platter until it warms back up. Uh, hopefully it gives you enough time to recover all the data. But that clicking sound is not a good sound. So now let's talk about if you get a failure to boot or the operating system not found. Well, your most likely cause, we kind of go back to the prior section, uh, it's a BIOS setting. More than likely, you have the wrong boot order. So you want to check the boot order in your BIOS settings. If it happens to be correct and you've gotten the operating system not found error, then you have a problem with your master boot record, your MVR. Um, there are a couple of utilities and things that you can do to fix that. I cover those in a different session. I'm trying to remember which session it is. I can't remember it off of my head. Um, but the command is fix boot and fix MBR. I do believe fix boot is yeah, fix boot is the one that you want to run first. Hopefully that resolves that operating system not found if the BIOS settings were correct. And the reason for that is fix boot is okay. If you run the fix NBR, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit. Most of the time it will fix that operating system not found error, but sometimes it uh, only makes things worse. And once you run fix MBR, there is no going back. Um, it's a done deal once you run it once. Fix boot, you can run over and over and over again, no problem. Uh, if you have a drive not recognized, the most likely cause is either, uh, for, if it's an external drive, it will be a file system or a partition issue. If it's an internal drive, uh, more likely it's a BIOS or cabling issue. Back to checking the system BIOS, check to make sure your cables are securely connected to the hard drive. Now let's talk about RAID arrays. So if you get a RAID not found error, the most likely cause is you're using the incorrect driver. 
Um, as I put down here, most often if you have RAID, it's set up as an external enclosure on its own with its own drivers. Uh, you might want to look at the manufacturer's website to see if they have an updated set of drivers or one that's more compatible with your operating system. If your RAID array stops working, the most likely cause is you have experienced a disk failure. Not too big of a deal. If you're using um, RAID 1 or RAID 5 or RAID 1 plus 0, but it's a really big deal if you're just running RAID 0. If you're RAID, running RAID 0, your data in that uh, stripe set is now lost and gone. Uh, going to be fairly hard to recover. If you're running any of the other versions of RAID, as in 1.5 or RAID 1 plus 0, also known as RAID 10, by the way, you can recover the data and rebuild the RAID array. If you happen to get the uh, BSOD, the blue screen of death, the most likely cause, again, would go back to the bad driver. Uh, RAID arrays are really particular about the drivers that are used, and the operating systems are very particular about which driver the RAID arrays are using. So it may take you some trial and error to find the correct one that works for you, but it can be done. And guess what? That covers all of the material for both, for exam objective 4.3, so tonight we covered exam objectives uh, 4.2 and 4.3 of the of CompTIA's exam 220-802, which happens to be the second half of the A plus exam. Are there any questions for me this evening? Hearing none. Thank you for watching and. We'll do it again next week.